So, if you were to ask a Doctor Who fan what the worst episode was, what the most awful and disappointing piece of media to come out of the show was, most people would point this story forward. The story that gathers dust on the DVD shelf, that comes last in the polls. The story that everybody hates. And this story is Time Lash. <laughs> I should probably start by mentioning that I only first watched this story a few years ago, aware of its reputation. I sure as hell took this on board, and after the credit rolled, well, it was good. Well, I say good. I would have classed this story as a guilty pleasure. I was aware of its flaws and gaping plot holes, however, I found the most part of the narrative was pretty enjoyable. But on the rewatch that sparked me to write this review, I somehow put all of those aforementioned flaws behind me and just enjoyed it for what it is. A 90 minute space opera about a corrupt government hidden behind a mask controlled by an idiosyncratic, power hungry leader. During season 22, the decision was made to change the format from the show from the usual 25 minute long episodes to a new 45 minute serial. And this, as many of the other stories in season 22, is the Achilles heel due to the pacing. A 45 minute format allows a lot of breathing room, but also may lead to a large amount of padding. And unfortunately, this is what we got here. But you can't completely blame them. The first part of the script underran, meaning a few scenes had to be scripted up. And you can tell. A lot of the scenes in the TARDIS drag. Is that bad? Bad! Bad! Well, they really drag. Even Nicola Bryant admitted that some of these scenes contain some of her worst acting. That may be due to her handling a pantomime at the same time, though. In fact, we don't really achieve too much from these starter scenes, apart from one of the worst visual effects I think I've ever seen in Doctor Who. Oh, and the fact that the Doctor and Perry attach seat belts to the TARDIS console. Yeah, I feel the story would have worked a lot better as a three-part 25-minute story, or even just a solid 45-minute episode. This particular script was submitted by Glenn McCoy, a new name to grace the worlds of Doctor Who. In fact, a rather new name to grace the worlds of screenwriting, having only written a hospital drama a few years prior, aptly titled Ambulance. Initially, Time Lash was intended to be a Dalek story, but Eric Sayward immediately rejected the script and Glenn had to rewrite. The final iteration of the story was about the Doctor falling through a time corridor and ending up on the planet Carfell, a planet he had supposedly been to before but was never seen in any sort of media up to that point. The Doctor and Perry arrive to learn that a girl has stolen a valuable piece of jewellery from the leader of the planet in a rebellion against the totalitarian state and fallen into the Time Lash, an opening in the vortex that the people of Carfell would throw rebels into. Okay, so the girl falling through the Time Lash adds nothing to the story whatsoever, but that's a nice idea. Again, I could see the Time Lash working as a Dalek story. Okay, so off the bat, a lot of people will complain about the way the story looks, and yes, a large amount of the budget of the season had been spent filming in Spain due to the prior story. But here they make did with what they had. What they had being some MDF and a box of Christmas decorations. Okay, so it is hard to take the time lapse as a serious threat when it's just some tinsel stuck up inside a repainted prop from the two Doctors, but the main set of the story looks quite good in my opinion, and so does the Borad's chamber. It was designed in such a way that allows for a more diverse array of shots, for example the overhead shots which look awesome. Speaking of the Borad, may I present to you one of the coolest looking and one of the most underrated monsters in Doctor Who history. I love the idea of the Borad. He's a corrupt, egocentric leader whose experiments went wrong and a tank of acid exploded on him, giving a deformed look. His motives are to create a new species by mating with another of one of the same distorted appearances. But there is no one else who looks like him, so the next logical step is to tie Perry up with a tank of acid attached to herself in a cave, confronted by a monster, and if it attacks her, the acid tank will explode and give her a deformed appearance like the Borad, so she will understand his pain and um, reproduce with him. Okay, so try and argue that this premise isn't dark as fuck. The Borad literally tortures Perry, intends to blow up a tank of acid on her, and then have sex with her at the end of it. Yeah, I could really understand people's complaints about how dark season 22 is. Okay, so, a large flaw, well, in fact probably the biggest flaw in this story, is the complete waste of H.G. Wells being butchered beyond belief by an actor who plays the role so campy, I've heard him been described as Adric's cousin with ADHD. Well, that's good! It means we can stand together, shoulder to shoulder, in the face of the enemy! Shut up! 
David Chandler just plays the role so over the top and it's a shame this is how such a great historical figure was portrayed, considering there's a lot of great opportunities to take with him. And using him to act as an assistant in a story like this is not one of them. It's also slightly offensive that the story implies such literary greats as the War of the Worlds to be influenced by fucking Time Lash. Okay, so I should probably talk a bit about the Doctor in his story, and he's really good. Colin Baker gives a stunning performance, as always, and is very convincing. Perry, unfortunately, doesn't really do a whole lot throughout this story, apart from act as a plot device. Thankfully, though, the two of them spend the majority of the second part separated, which is a relief, as by this point in the series, I was fed up with their constant conflict and arguing amongst each other that just made the story drag even more. See Attack of the Cybermen. I realised a lot of what the season does is use the past as a crutch, and not in a good way. At this point, home media wasn't really a big thing. A large proportion of the stories the current viewer had probably never seen, and the season opener, Attack of the Cybermen, this relies heavily on the then missing Tomb of the Cybermen, which hardly any of the viewers had seen. The two doctors brought back an old doctor in Colin's first season, and this story goes off an entire past adventure that was never seen on screen. What does he mean? It's a long story, her, but no time to tell it now. Right. So what was the point? On another note, Paul Darrow looks as if he's having an absolute ball taking a piss out the show, just as Colin had done a few years prior on Blake 7. I mean, at least he's not on a mobility scooter advert. Thanks to Forever Active and their range of easy-to-drive mobility vehicles. Also, may I just take a moment to praise the soundtrack? This is by far one of the best scores in Classic Who. The mixing on the 50th anniversary re-release is just amazing. The ending is what gets a lot of complaints, because it just keeps on going. There is a fantastic ending scene in which the Doctor simply gives the Borad what he deserves. This would have been a great end for the story, but for some reason the Banjals just decide to suddenly fire a missile at Carfell, and the Doctor stops it by flying his TARDIS into it and then is completely fine. So what was the point in that? What was the point in him telling Perry it was too dangerous for her to come and them arguing about it for 15 fucking minutes? And then somehow the Borad manages to clone himself, but is then thrown into Time Lash again, which Colin gives a very undoctorly monologue. Okay, so of course Time Lash isn't a fantastic episode by any stretch of the imagination, but just take into account some of the things I've said and some of the elements that make Time Lash what it is. Every series has its off day. For season 19, it's Time Flight. For season 4, it's The Underwater Menace. And unfortunately, for season 22, it's Time Lash. Probably worth mentioning that I also quite like the aforementioned story, despite their poor reputation, and will defend them until I die. So next time, when you sit down to watch Time Lash, if you can face it, just consider what I've said throughout the course of the video. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm just asking that you appreciate Time Lash, not for what it is, but for what it's trying to be.